Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Starting Line. I'm your host, Sarah Allen. Representatives are returning back to work after the House Passover Easter break. It was a time many were looking forward to as leading up to the break, long nights to get bills through committees became the norm. Members, just so you know, just a reminder, we're racing to finish all these TIF bills that people are getting in at the end here for Representative Detmer and Representative Mason, and they keep trickling in. You know, we are getting to the end of hearings, so if you have them, folks, get them in. This week's starting line looks at House File 1577, a bill that creates a special education scholarship program. We sit down with the bill's sponsor, Representative Glenn Grunhagen, to learn more details about the bill. Grunhagen, a small business owner from Glencoe, is serving his second term in the Minnesota House of Representatives. He represents District 18B. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen, for joining us and talking to us about your bill. To start off, can you explain how this bill would work? Thank you, Sarah. And it's uh, nice to be able to have a chance to explain this bill. Uh, and hopefully people can learn from this interview what my bill is about. But basically the motivation of this bill, I was a uh, public school board member for about 16 years. And I became involved in uh, a number of special ed situations. And some of those situations were not very uh, positive. The parents were extremely frustrated with the school district. They believed their child needed additional services. The school district uh, didn't necessarily agree. Uh, in one particular case, the parent uh, wanted the child bused uh, to the metro area to receive additional services, uh, but the school district obviously didn't want to do that, cost additional money. And uh, so the result is, I believe the special ed uh, uh, program in the state of Minnesota needs some reform. We cannot continue to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results. Uh, there's also financial reasons for this. Um, special ed uh, enrollment has gone up dramatically. It's not fully funded uh, either by the state or the federal government. So there, there is additional costs that are picked up by your local school district. And I believe that adding a reform to special ed that gives uh, parents of special ed students, and by the way, I have a nephew who's special ed, okay? So I have first-hand experience with this. Uh, to give those parents that if they're not satisfied with the services that the school district is offer, offering, that they can sign a form that relieves the uh, school district of responsibility to provide a special ed services and then they, they can seek services on their own. They, they would get a scholarship monitored by the local school district and approved by the Commissioner of Education. But if they believe there were services out there that could better meet the need of their child, they would receive a reduced amount. And that amount is still being uh, discussed as far as the bill, but it'd be pro probably in the range of 70, 70, 70 to 75% of the current special ed funding for their child. And they could hire their own services. Now, the people that would be certified to give those services would have to be approved by the Commissioner of, of uh, Education. So we have oversight, but my thought is there's a host of retired teachers out there with uh, tremendous experience and skills, and uh, this would give them an opportunity, and, they, and my bill allows them to be uh, licensed on a limited basis uh, to be able to offer services to parents who um, want certain skills and uh, uh, programs brought to their child that the school district on a, on a broader scale might not be able to provide. This bill is patterned after a bill in uh, Florida that was upheld by the uh, U.S. Supreme Court as legal. So that's where I initiated the idea from, uh, from the Florida law, and then also from uh, my own personal experience as a school board member. What are the hurdles of getting your bill passed? I think the primary thing is to have people understand what it does. And we know with government, uh, reform is difficult. Everybody's used to doing things a certain way, OK? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard to get them to see things from a different perspective. But I do think in this particular case, it's generally well known by all representatives and senators that uh, there's a uh, there's not enough financial resources to fund all the requests. 
Therefore, we have to look at reform, and we have to, to uh, try to do things that still meet the needs, but in a more cost-efficient way. And if at all possible, try to keep the lawyers out of the situation, which, which can drain thousands and thousands of dollars of resources that could be used to help uh, students and uh, public education rather than uh, going for legal fees. So uh, I think as people see this as a viable alternative to uh, bringing cost efficiency and effectiveness to special ed situations, I think uh, the support will grow. And again, we have a pilot program in, in Florida, and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing some results out of that in terms of uh, what parents are choosing to do and also cost savings and the effectiveness of the program. How long has the Florida pilot program been in operation? Uh, about two to three years is my understanding. Okay, I think it's closer to two. So uh, they should be having some data on that mm -hmm. shortly. Uh, and uh, I need to do additional research. I've uh, been in some, I've been in, I'm on the HHS committees, both finance and uh, policy, and I'm also on K-12 finance, and I'm on higher ed. So I, I sleep about once a week. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you'd like to help me out on this, I'd certainly appreciate it. Maybe the viewers will. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, if anybody out there like to work with me on it, I could use the help. I. You know, I don't believe in cloning, but up here I could use about three or four of me, to tell you the truth. What is the likely path your bill will take? I think for this session, if I can get a hearing on it and start uh, uh, getting uh, legislators to hear the perspective, start uh, uh, getting some information from the department and also doing some additional resources, and then I, I would really like to work on it over the uh, off-session time uh, with the uh, different parties involved. Mm -hmm. And I know there are special ed organizations out there. I'd like to get their involvement and input and uh, hopefully next session bring a strong bill that's been critiqued by, from numerous perspectives uh, to the legislature and uh, look to make some reforms. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I just appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, have this interview and to uh, put my perspective out there on this vitally important issue. Let's go and track House File 1577 through the legislative process. It's had its introduction and first reading. It was referred to the Education Policy Committee, and we're gonna have to wait and see what's in store for this bill. You can learn more about these bills and others through our online news service, Session Daily. This nonpartisan news source employs a staff of professional writers, editors, and photographers that provide you with in-depth coverage of the Minnesota House of Representatives. You can also watch live coverage of committee and floor action on House TV. To see past bills featured on Starting Line, go to www.youtube.com backslash mnhouseinfo and click on the Starting Line playlist. Coming up next week, Starting Line will feature a different bill and look to see if there's been any movement on Representative Grunhagen's bill or other bills we have highlighted. And remember, thousands of bills get introduced every legislative session in Minnesota. All of them first have to cross the Starting Line.